Now, Charcot's spine is, again, a relatively rare complication and a very late complication after a spinal cord injury. Um, the pathogenesis of the deformity is likely due to lack of sensory input to the spine below the level of injury, which leads to abnormal motions and stresses on the spine. Um, and that will cause progressive destruction of cartilage and subchondral bone damage, and it actually creates a false joint somewhere along the spine, always distal to the level of injury. Um, and Charcot spines can present very, very late, as late as, you know, 30 years after, after um, injury. And because Charcot spines are an interest of mine um, and present in a really interesting, you know, surgical problem that's very sort of distinctive, I'm going to go a bit in depth into their management here as a late sequela of spinal cord injury, just because I think that they're cool um, and I, I enjoy managing them. So you can see here some of the main characteristics of a Charcot spine. Um, so this is a sagittal view. So this is um, belly, this is the back. These are the two disarticulated ends of the spine. Okay. Um, these will often rub together and create an audible thunk that the patient can hear or feel as they move around. Um, and you can also see this sort of copious fluid here produced by the process. Um, sometimes this can either mimic an infection or actually become infected since it's just this, you know, inert fluid um, that's sitting there. And so it's just asking to get infected. And so um, ruling out infection is an important part of the management of these. And Charcot spines, um, you know, present significant difficulty with respect to spinal reconstruction and successful fusion, and thus they're, you know, interesting to me as a surgeon. They have um, large bony defects um, and often present limitations in the fixation and reconstruction because um, they've just have such a huge defect and they've often had numerous revision surgeries. So it's really salvage surgery that we're um, doing with these. And certain patients are at increased risk for this condition after having a spinal cord injury. Um, we think that patients who have a long segment fusion from their initial injury are, are at higher risk from this. Um, patients who have had a laminectomy, patients who have excessive loading, or like patients who do really intensive sports after their injury, um, maybe increased risk because of all that loading and motion. Um, also obesity and sitting imbalance can, can predispose one to, to having these. Um, importantly, these risk factors actually will be exacerbated sometimes after the initial surgery for a Charcot spine, um, and that may contribute to the high rate of recurrence, which we see in these patients. Um, revision rates for hardware failure or of recurrent Charcot or non-union um, have been reported to range up to 75% after an initial surgery. Um, and in order to minimize the risk of failure or recurrence, um, there are some best practices that have been delineated when doing um, these surgeries. Um, and so some of those include employing a lesional debridement, so getting all of the stuff out, a circumferential fusion, so anterior and posterior fusion technique, um, fusing down of the pelvis if you're going into the lumbar spine, using four rod constructs, so two rods on either side, um, using BMP to, to create bone formation, all of those things are considered best practices. But um, even when you do that stuff, the overall rate of revision due to hardware failure or recurrent um, shark coat spine is still 35%. So um, even if we do all those things. So again, um, this is a topic of interest to me and my partners, and we do a fair amount of these surgeries and have published um, techniques for salvage and the revision of Charcot surgery, um, which is what these images are from. So I'm just going to take you through um, this patient's imaging because um, it sort of uh, details um, some common issues. So this is a guy um, who had a, a high thoracic injury. Okay, He actually had a mid thoracic Charcot spine. That's this big destructive thing here. And you can see the anterior um, cage placed. And he had a long segment fusion after that to stabilize because you want multiple, again, multiple fixation points. This is just like an initial trauma. It's a disarticulation of the spine. And so then he got another one. Um, you can see this huge destructive process here. And so again, following best practices, did an intralesional debridement, took out all that crap that's in there, did anterior fusion at every level, all the way down to the pelvis, four rod construct, and then he got it again. And it's like even bigger, it's massive. Um, and so again, go back in, debride everything um, and, and repair it. And so our salvage technique in this case was actually to transect the fecal sac because he didn't have any functional neuro, neural tissue um, and then do a big um, anterior reconstruction and use a structural allograft. This is a fibula in the actual spinal canal as a structural um, allograft. So this technique of fecal transection um, is, you know, a salvage technique. And we've published on this um, in each of the patients where we've done this, they have a chronic complete spinal cord injury. Um, when we transect the fecal sac, there was no clinical sequela at all um, and no functional or really even identifiable structures were encountered when we did the, the transection. Um, there was no spinal fluid encountered. Um, nobody had the spinal fluid leak. Um, and so 
you know, that was helpful for us because we were able to use the canal as a, as a fusion surface. Um, and also we could do an easier interlesional de um, debris because we didn't have to work around the fecal sac. And here's another one that we did um, that was the same kind of thing. So again, thoracic cord level, um, then a upper lumbar Charcot spine had carried all the way down to the pelvis, anterior fusion at each level, um, interlesional debridement. Um, and then you can see it failed actually at S1. And so you can see this femoral ring here at S1 and it like fell out, it fell out here and it's like now on its side in the pelvis. Um, and there's this huge um, defect here. And so um, again, re revised it, um, did a fecal transection and this is a femur. It's a huge um, piece of bone. Um, that we put into this um, defect for a structural allograft as well as to um, encourage fusion. So these are really big, um, intense cases. Um, definitely want to be at a specialized center to, to do this kind of um, thing. And, um, you know, they're surgically very interesting, but, the, but it really illustrates the fact that when you have a spinal cord injury, um, you end up having issues that are going to require advanced medical care really for the rest of your life. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from NeurosurgeryTraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.